Um, so on. talking about the, the wood, the wood, and I found my notes from what uh, Nishioka Sensei said. He said, I vow to commit no act that will extinguish the life of this tree before yes. he does. Beautiful. What a beautiful thing to do to show respect for the tree. And, and he meant it. He really meant it. Uh, and this is a sort of thing that a person can sort of say as a matter of course, as a matter of form, but I think he, he really believed it, and I think we see this reflected in, in his work. Uh, but the crucial problem for uh, continuing Japanese carpentry, especially something like temples, which require very, very large logs of very, very high quality, is that there's just not enough of them. And Japan had been deforested, you know, several times. Uh, and that's what a big key of my book about the Edo period sustainable practices focused on forestry and, and reforestation, how they're able to reforest the nation. Uh, and decisions were made uh, when it was reforested. So Hinoki is the, the prized lumber but it was always uh, more expensive, uh, higher quality, higher grade of lumber. Uh, Sugi, Japanese cedar, was a very, very good wood and was used a lot as well. Uh, and that ended up being planted uh, in huge quantities throughout Japan, uh, particularly in the Edo period, uh, as a commercial lumber crop to provide wood for, for things. So what had initially, uh, in the natural state of, of Japanese uh, mountain and environment, had been mixed forest. You'd have some hardwoods. You'd have your, your you know, uh, keakis and some, you know, maples and some other things, as well as the evergreens, the hinoki and the sugi and others, uh, and pine. Um, gradually, these became sort of mountain plantations, uh, uh, growing almost only sugi. And they, we could now consider them to be sort of an invasive species. And the problem in Japan now is that um, in many places, because of the market price of the lumber, it is much less expensive to import wood from somewhere else, such as uh, Southeast Asia or other places, that uh, there's not a lot of motivation for the people who own these mountains, who own these forests, to maintain them, take care of them, to cut them, and, and to, to produce lumber from them. So they're sort of growing wild and, and unkempt, which is not good for the environment. Uh, so there's a lot of sugi in Japan. Uh, there's still a lot of good wood in Japan, uh, and it could and should be used, I think. But uh, the market price uh, just doesn't make it uh, worthwhile uh, for, for people who are actually trying to do that as a business. Uh, but there is a movement now to uh, help restore those forests to uh, mixed forest conditions. So intentionally uh, cutting and lumbering and then replanting with other species as well. Uh, because mixed forests are generally going to be healthier in a lot of ways. Uh, so I think it may take generations for this to actually, uh, you know, occur in a, in a, in a large scale. But I, I do see that uh, experts and specialists and people who care about the environment are very, very uh, interested in seeing this happen. Well, we should be planning uh, for the next thousand years, right? So what trees do we want in a thousand years for the temple? We should be planting that, the nice hinoki, we should be making hinoki forest or diverse forest. I mean, when I look at the mountains in autumn, especially, I noticed this, when you see all the beautiful colors mixed, you know that's a natural diverse forest. You look at the ones that are quickly planted for forest, just for wood or for whatever reason, and it's all a mono culture, right? It's all one type of tree. And you're thinking, mm -hmm. I know which one I would like to live in, which one I would like to live near. And of course, animals feel the same. Animals prefer diverse forests. It's more healthy for the soil. There's so many positive effects. I just hope that now they are planning for a more diverse second thousand years of forestry so that that's nice to hear there are some people yeah. thinking about it I, yes there are and and it's interesting because we now understand and again, this was something the people, the ancients our, our, our ancestors understood very very well without needing to be told that forests provide a lot of services, environmental services, and you may mention, you know, a, a habitat for other animals, for other wildlife, um, you know, sources of food, um, you know, chestnut trees, other trees that grow nuts. Um, these things are all all very important. And, um, and of course, you know, there are lots of places where you'll find, let's say, a forest of just birches or a forest of just pines, and these occur naturally as well, but not over such a broad 
area. Uh, and I think what I see from the people interested in, in restoring Japanese forests is this understanding of this variety of services that forests that forests provide and trying to restore those conditions. So, um, and again, it means partly food bearing species, uh, hardwood species, you know, species like oak, species chestnuts, uh, again, buna, uh, lots of other species that can co coexist and should be allowed to coexist along with places where the evergreen trees would be. But in Japan, in terms of our architecture, I would say Hinoki is the one that is most in need, although there are some good Hinoki forests. Uh, and for instance, the great shrine at Issei, Issei Jingu, um, they, they own a forest with Hinoki, which was intended to be used for the, you know, 20 year periodic reconstruction of the of, of the shrine uh, but the last reconstruction I was told also used wood from Taiwan and it was partly because of cost and then partly because of the need to keep those trees for the future for future use so I think planting a lot of hinoki would be very very good uh, there is a project there's an Englishman who um, planted a lot of lacquer trees uh, his name is David Atkinson. He's sort of involved in in in, in some historic preservation and things like that. And uh, he understood that uh, for maybe the last several decades, it was hard to find Japanese lacquer, uh, and was all being imported from China. And again, like these things always are, it's a slightly different species with slightly different characteristics. And the craftspeople would prefer to use Japanese lacquer. So he has a project to to plant. Uh, forests of lacquer trees. So this kind of thing, I think, should be done. And um, and it would be good to, to maintain these these local species that, um, you know, were essential for the, 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 the quality and, and characteristics of the traditional crafts. Yeah, I love that part in your book when you say, uh, Nishioka Sensei was saying, if any carpenter ever uses Hinoki for the first time, they will want to use nothing else forever yeah. <laughs> like it's such well, a carpenter's favorite it's the best wood for carpentry yeah and you know i only knew it by reputation before i actually came to japan i would read the book it's hinoki and i knew it was a kind of cypress and i'm from louisiana and we use cypress so i'm kind of familiar with other cypresses but i remember the first time walking into the wood shop the workshop at yakushiji and the aroma of this wood the, the the entire atmosphere was the aroma of hinoki it was astounding and and it is this beautiful sharp spicy clear it's it's a clear-headed aroma uh and and that was just wonderful for me uh and again it's it's not just the wood they're cutting but then all the shavings and things that had fallen on the ground and this was this beautiful environment of hinoki and sure enough as i got to understand the wood i could see why uh, it just works so cleanly. It cuts so cleanly. It planes so beautifully. Uh, it is an extreme, extremely resilient wood. I mean, it's strong. It has it wood has different kinds of strength. It has a strong compressive strength. You can push it, push on it, it'll hold things. But it also has a very good bending strength. Uh, it's called the bending moment. And this is apparently, according to Nishioka, what he explained to me was this is one of the keys for why it's such an important wood for Japanese style temple buildings. And he mentioned that when he was working on Horiji Temple, again, the, the roof sort of sticks out of cantilevers out. Here's the wall and the columns, and this is the eaves, and this sticks out, and this is held by uh, these rafters. It's called Haruki. Uh, and when he was res working on restoring Horiji Temple, uh, I guess it was before the war, uh, they removed all of the tile, and there's this clay that was holding all the tiles. Very, very uh, weighty stuff. And over the course of several days, these rafters gradually returned to their original position. In other words, they still maintained their tensile strength after a thousand years, uh, which to him was amazing and eye-opening, saying, wow, this stuff is really, really great wood. Uh, so that was one example. And then he also showed me uh, a box that uh, he, he had given some uh, a piece of uh, the rafter and it's about 10 centimeters square and long and he had given it to a craftsman to make a box out of and uh, one thing he pointed out to me he says look at the end grain you see how fine the end grain it was really like a mi each ring was like a millimeter from the other it's like close ring he says this was thousand year wood you know, this is why we want the old trees we want it to be this close grain and then he opened the lid of this box and it smelled like hinoki this was a thousand-year piece of wood that still had an aroma. 
So that was to me astounding as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, when we had our remodel done, we used Sugi in the Uh uh, bathroom. And if it's closed for a couple of days and you open it, you can still smell it. But after a thousand years, having a box still smell, that's amazing. (laughs) Maybe not a bath, but, uh, but, uh, but yes, yeah, sugi is a it, and it's a very beautiful wood, and a good sugi is is a fabulous uh, material that can last a long time. Lots of major buildings, including temples, are built using a lot of sugi. Uh, it lasts a long time. Keaki as well. It's a harder wood, uh, also lasts a very very long time. But but hinoki is like magic. You know, it's it's just a different kind of being. <laughs> And there's certainly scientific explanations for the the resins, et cetera, in the wood that are, are given giving the aroma and why they persist so long. But uh, it's a, just a beautiful, in, beautiful wood. In the book, you say the best hinoki is in Yoshino, in the Nara era area around the where the temple was, um, because mm-hmm. it has really good soil there. So that understanding that good trees, good forests comes from good soil. How do we take care of the soil? We don't use pesticides. It's it's like we talked about last week, right? Everything yeah. is connected. We need to take care of every part of the environment because we need it. We need it for things we want to make and do. Right? Yes, it, it's all connected. It's absolutely all connected, and uh, yeah, the Yoshino uh, Yoshino Hinoki. This this um you know was. Again, this is the Nara era and area, and I think most of the temples in that area used even back in the seventh, eighth century were were sourcing wood from there. Of course, even at this time, they had to get wood from even further away, especially the building of Todaiji Temple, which is a very big temple, large size. They had to get lumber even from a, a much greater distance. But yeah, this was like the local wood, and it would be best for uh, use in temples in Nara. And um, again, I'm not sure what the soil characteristics are, but again, Nishioka learned soil science and learned these things. So he understood that very, very well from a scientific standpoint, as well as from the point of view of a carpenter. Um, yeah, there's some other great things. You know, the other trees that he he thought was the best is um, is Yakusugi, Yakushima. He would talk about uh, the trees in Yakushima, you know, these 2,000 year old trees, and uh, so just with this wistfulness. There was so, even Yakushima was so overforested for a while yeah, that luckily it got protection status and they preserved yeah. some, but yeah. they were just putting them all down, using them, right? Yeah. For a long time. Yeah. Yeah, like everywhere. But again, the, the nation was it needed the resources. And um, and uh, one major period of deforestation was before the Edo period, uh, during the Sengoku period, before the Edo period. Uh, lots of deforestation all around the country. Uh, most of Kansai, a lot of Kanto as well. Uh, in order to build big projects in, in uh, the Kansai area, uh, they would have to get wood from Tohoku. That's ridiculous I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable that they had to do that uh, and then they were able to restore they japanese developed regenerative forestry to make sure when the wood was cut that they were replanting enough to take take its place uh and and to make sure that there was sort of a social and another system in place to, to monitor that um but then in the second war again you had a horrific deforestation uh and um uh, you know had a great great effect so most of our forests in japan now are post-war forests most of them, and Yakush- Yakushima is a special case, uh, and it's wonderful that those trees have survived as long as they have. And and again, we talked about how Nishioka has been more appreciated in in the years since he's died. I think there's just been a general growth of appreciation of these things, including the environment, including places like Yakushima, uh, in the last you know 30, 30 years or so. And I'm glad to see that. That's great. And an interesting knock-on effect, which I noticed recently with shochu makers sake makers, miso makers, um, any maker who uses the wooden barrels, they've Mm -hmm. been talking about how their original shoyu or miso barrels, that big, huge size, used to be one trunk of a tree that Uh they made these beautiful big barrels from. And they're able to use it for 150 to 200 years. But now is the time when they need new barrels and there are no trees of that size Mm -hmm. and there are no barrel makers. So there's a whole new demand now from traditional businesses who need the the traditional wooden products. And I thought that's really interesting. 
there are yeah, some that, small companies doing barrels. It's fascinating. But, yeah. Again, if it's a big barrel, that tree, maybe it was going to be 300 years minimum, you know, 500 years or something. Uh, so, if, you know, who's we can't wait that long. Uh, what are we going to do? So, of course, it, it's something I, you know, that connects to joinery and how these things evolved is over the course of time, uh, a lot of the techniques evolved to be able to make use of uh, smaller pieces of wood, smaller timbers, because the large timbers were not available. So some aspects of joinery in Japan evolved specifically to like connect things. You'd want to use one if you could, but they you can't get it, so you have to use two or three. And how do you connect these things and and and, and put them together? And I think maybe barrel makers and anyone working with wood, uh, that's that becomes a major consideration. How do you maximize the use of the the wood that you have uh, because you can't get one big piece of wood of the right dimension yeah wonderful yeah. well thank yeah. you so much that's a great bonus pit of information that i think we didn't have time to cover <laughs> bonus. So yes Yay, bonus. yes there's so much to say there's so much to say uh oh but it's my. true you pointing out that these issues of wood availability, deforestation, uh, lack of lack of uh, the right kind of trees affects every craftsperson working with wood in Japan and many around the world as well. Whether it's boat makers, cabinet makers, uh, carpenters, architects, um, and you know, there, everyone's there dealing with no the same thing. There is no good replacement material. Like at the miso factory, she said, we do have some plastic vats. We do mm. have vats made of porcelain even. We have like different kinds of materials, mm. but the wooden ones are the best. We need the wooden ones. They yep. give the best flavor. They work the best in fermentation. So, you know, in terms of temples as well, can you imagine a temple built out of anything that's not wood? Like it just wouldn't be right, right? But there's lots of them, concrete concrete uh, and there's a whole trend especially in the post-war period um, to rebuild them to look like they were made of with the original form but made of concrete and you know there's a lot of concrete temples uh, and there's actually some beautiful modern designs that are good that are not wood necessarily uh, but can use other materials in a beautiful way but basically wood is you know again from Nishiko's point of view as an act of devotion, uh, being a, a temple carpenter, as an act of Buddhist devotion, uh, is a special thing. And uh, you can't do it for the profit motive. Uh, it, it can't be done for uh, any motivation other than devotion if it's going to be done the right way. Uh, so that's very different. Even other good carpenters that I've seen, I mentioned, you know, they often don't have that spirituality and that motivation. Uh, so... I think that's the huge, the huge difference. Yeah, that was the shame. We didn't have time to talk about that either. Like you talk about the outside being bright and the inside being dark. And that's yeah. by design uh, mm -hmm. to give you a sense of reverence and a sense mm -hmm. of connection to history. That people mm -hmm. who have always, over time, visited temples have had that same feeling. I thought yeah. that was beautiful. Yeah. I'm, and God, you know, another thing that it just, uh, it's, one of those sensations that that just never leaves me is in the hot summer to go inside the temple building and it's instantly several degrees cooler and smells of incense you know that sensation and just actually maybe year before last before corona i was traveling with some friends we went to nara went around and it was blazing hot and it was like yeah we go into the building and it's like ah and this is this traditional you know passive cooling you know kind of sustainable architecture concept you know in life and the way it had been for 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 millennia it works plus we know that people feel healthier and are healthier the air quality is cleaner if it's made mm -hmm. of wood versus concrete mm -hmm. and other materials so yeah thank you so much that was that was great as we thank yeah. you as always wonderful yeah okay Thank you. Um, 